I drink uh, I drink a lot of coffee. You do? During the day. It's, you know, I'm a coffee addict. Okay. And uh, I actually uh, work to moderate it. In other words, I used okay. to just mainline it, but now I'm like, you know, I don't just, you know, finish finish one and then indiscriminately get another. Okay. I pace myself. Okay. Um, but Are I love you... coffee, and it's, it's integral to my work. It's just something I do when I'm working. Do you keep a cigar sticking out the side of your mouth at <laughs> yeah. the same time? And a... And a uh... Exactly. No, I need a fedora. I need a little reward, and coffee is a reward. Um, yeah, it just it, it agrees with me. So uh, yeah, and uh, every I guess everybody has to have their poison. I yeah. guess you yeah. Know. yeah. Well, yeah. I don't think of it as poison. I um, used to be able to do it, and then I just this is really unusual for me. So just to even get a <coughs> coffee at, at, like after the morning. Yeah. It's just like when I don't have as much. It's my my whole I guess system changed or my tastes changed a bit. Where I I, I used to be like that a lot too, and then I just at some I just well it would keep I'm much more sensitive to the caffeine, but I guess you could build a tolerance for it. I've gone in the exact opposite direction, <laughs> even though I've wow. even though okay. I've been a coffee addict for decades. Yeah. It used to be that um, I don't know if I had coffee after four p.m. or whatever. I risk keeping myself up at night yeah. or whatever, and I still try to watch it. I don't really have it at night, but. In general, my tolerance is higher. Mm-hmm. I find that okay. it's a very rare day when right. the caffeine I've had interferes with my sleep. Social media, low tolerance. Caffeine, I do- I'll, I'll <laughs> keep that in, I promise. That's okay. <laughs> you can put that. All right. Well, it's thank you. Okay, now I'll be the earnest me and, <laughs> and say hi. The fun Welcome is done. back. <laughs> no, no, no. Welcome back, Owen, to uh, the podcast. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're glad we're here at. We're, we're here at Elephant and Castle, an old New York institution. So grateful it's still here. I know. It is one of those places that's eternal. It seems like they must have some deal. <laughs> Sweetheart deal. Yeah. I mean, maybe this, you know, the owner owns the building or something like Gotta that. Gotta be. But, uh, but one of the cool things about it is one of the reasons I suggested we come here is that lots of times you even pick out a place to go that you think is going to be quiet. You remember that it's quiet, but when you get there, you go, "Oh wow, we <laughs> Wait, this quiet place." They play music that, and that quiet. The music's kind of loud. Elephant and Castle really is quiet, and the oh. thing is, that's so wonderful. Why don't we want quiet in our public spaces anymore? That's mm-hmm. really odd to me. I know it's true. I walked. I had to walk out of one place not that long ago where it was that loud. I'm not like super crotchety about these things, but. Uh, uh, it was so loud. I'm like, <coughs> you really could not hear across the person. Well, there's this thing that I had been crotchety about for years, and it, I mean, people started talking about this at least 20 years ago. This was, mm-hmm. I think, fairly common knowledge that, um, you know, when they designed restaurants in New York mm-hmm. to be hot restaurants, they literally would build the walls out of material that would reflect sound to create that buzzier thing. Well, sure, because sure. Mm-hmm. that volume meant, meant that you had. A buzzy place. Yeah. But the thing is that even going back to my days where I actually used to like to go to buzzy places, mm-hmm. I would still sit there and go, why would I be enjoying the fact that it's hard to hear the person across from me? Why mm-hmm. would that be fun? I don't, yeah. I don't get that. That's the beginning of crotchiness. That, yeah. When you first posed that question. Oh, I was that way when I was 15. No. Yeah, <laughs> fine. That's fine. Some people suffer. Oh, oh, sorry. That's okay. Yeah, a second. Yeah. I, mine was doing the same thing. Okay. We'll be right back. Back on here. You said you were cro- yes. Uh, I, uh, yes, I was. I've, I've been crunchy about those kinds of things, yeah. like loud music. Since I was, <laughs> a kid. I mean, I love loud music. I just mean loud In music interfering with conversation. Sure, you know, yeah, like makes sense. That, well, uh, here. I used to say things. You know, when I was a teenager, I used to say things like this. This is the end of civilization. And sometimes I look back and think, maybe I was right. I don't know. <laughs> maybe yeah. this is why we have Trump, because people stopped listening to each other in restaurants and clubs. <laughs> it's all part of the, yes, of a case that you can make. And you grew up in New York. I grew up in, 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 Mich- in, in, no, in Michigan. In Michigan. Right, right. In Ann Arbor. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. Uh, and when did you move to New York again? I moved to New York uh, for the startup of Entertainment Weekly. Oh, right. Okay. And I always remember the date I moved. I moved to, to New York. It's a funny story. At the end of the '80s, literally, uh-huh. I literally moved. You know, I had literally was told that I got that job uh, the day before Thanksgiving mm-hmm. of 1989, and they kept me waiting for a long time. And then it was like, get right out here. Mm-hmm. I literally moved from Boston to New York on December 1st, 1989. 
And so I lived here for the last month of the 80s. Um, but it is funny because, I mean, that's just kind of a coincidence. <laughs> that is but, the best month. But the truth is that it, that was Service. that transitional time uh-huh. of the end of the 80s. And the thing I remember when I came to New York and, like, I'd never, you know, it seems like gossip has been with us forever. I mean, our whole gossip culture, mm-hmm. the way it took over. But mm-hmm. it didn't always take over. And even then it was much smaller. And, you know. I read the gossip column in the Boston Herald or whatever. Didn't think that much about it because it was it was kind of a curiosity almost. It was not. It was the exception. It was a curiosity. I'm even somebody yeah. who used to when people thought I was crazy to do this. I always, uh, from a young, sought out the National Enquirer and stuff like that. It's still this sideline thing. When I came to New York, well, that's just, not gossip. That's fiction. But yeah, continue. I'm sorry. Right. Well, it didn't used to be fiction. It um, when I came to New York, you realized that the whole gossip thing, the New York Post, page six, all of it was more central to here, especially if you worked in entertainment. Mm-hmm. So I immersed myself in it. And right when I arrived here, the whole thing that was happening mm-hmm. was Trump on the ski slopes with Marla Maples <laughs> oh, right. and all of that. That was such a huge story. And I lived in the village, and every day I would go to my favorite restaurant that I still regret closing, The Bagel, the best breakfast place I've ever known in my life. It's a tiny place. I would sit in The Bagel uh-huh. and read my first few months in New York. I would sit in the bagel and read about Donald Trump every morning. That, that, that story just ruled. Strange. 30 years later, you're still doing it. Yes. Except you're not in the bagel. Nothing changed. Yeah. Interesting. So the last month of the 80s, huh? you were here the last week, December, you said, last month of right. the, right? Well, December. maybe the more significant thing, think. you know, it's just sort of funny that I moved here on December 1st. But the more significant thing is that I moved here for the start of Entertainment Weekly. And Entertainment Weekly, coincidentally, or maybe a little bit karmically, was launched in time for the 90s. And there was a way that yeah. what Entertainment Weekly was and what it kind of crystallized mm-hmm. did sort of just go right along with the 90s. And I'm not alone in <coughs> having a tremendous amount of affection and nostalgia for the 90s. Yeah, no, um, I, I agree with that. Um, the 90s maybe were... in some ways we were all deluded. It was just that we were uh, leveraged more than we knew and didn't realize the crash was coming. But still, it seemed like yeah. things were getting better. Yeah. The 90s were very kind to me as well, um, and um, I was, I think I was still living in, yeah, I was still living in Brooklyn at the late 80s, well, until the early 90s, moved into, we're, I should mention we're sitting behind the cappuccino or espresso maker, so that's the only downside. I thought we were lucky in this little semi-booth kind of thing, but it's fine. No, it's all right. Through the miracle of editing, I'll, I'll fix some of this. And then I moved into Manhattan in 93, I guess. Where I would live for the next good ten years. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, and my parents moved into the village in eighty eighty eight. Oh wow! They had lived in you know Queens and they sold their home and they lived uh, on Tenth Street and Fifth Avenue for the next thirty years or twenty five years. Yeah, oh yeah. that's great. It's a lot, very popular drink right now, the cappuccino. So, <laughs> dude, nobody's in I here. Thought this was no, I know it's right. But I also thought it was like this would be strategically a good spot. But yeah, so much for my theory of quiet. No, it's right. there's no quiet yeah, spaces but left these, in New York. It's hard to think of these things, but it's still going to come out great. I can. Uh, this machine is really good, and and if you're cl- relatively <coughs> close to the mic, which you are, yeah, uh, it's going to sound fine. Great, It'll be great. It, it's atmosphere. Yeah, it is. We're in a. Pop- well, you know. Um, I do. I've been get the crotchety part for me is now is just just having to read in the paper or or online wherever every day about another favorite spot closing down and right. the most recent one was uh, the Half Moon uh, Bar on West Twenty Third Street, yep. which is right by the High Line. You know the place where yep. they have an author yep. series there, and it's half owned by the Half King. The Half King, excuse yes. me. What did I say? The Half yep. Yeah. Moon. The bar that uh, the, the bar that King Sebastian right. Younger kind that's of put right. his the half na- owner, name right. on. And, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and oh, that, is, that, is, that, is a, that is a terrific place. Yeah, I, I actually have such great memories. I spent uh, the first Obama election, the first two thousand. I guess it was what, still two thousand seven, right? Or yeah, yeah, there with my friend, the ninety one, and we, it was a very you know wonderful evening. In- we, we know it's funny you bring that up because we're simply you know sitting in one of these eternal places in New York. But mm-hmm. one of the things I love about movie reviewing, seriously, I mean this is one of the the prime things for me mm-hmm. is that movies are about everything if you watch enough of them and so it gives a critic an opportunity to write about you know, anything credible array of subjects 
And the thing you're talking about, restaurants in New York or plays just play favorite haunts, closing, something I've been experiencing in the village, talking about with friends for years. I finally actually got to write about that at Variety a couple of months ago because... Because of which documentary? Uh, the documentary called The Lost Village. A guy oh, made yeah. a documentary that I actually found, in many ways, was very inadequate in terms of capturing that situation. Mm. Uh, there were some good things about it, but it was way too focused on... He was pro-developer. <laughs> well, he wasn't pro-developer. No, he was very anti, but he was very, way too focused on NYU as these land barons. Right. That is a factor in this whole thing. Sure. It's not the only factor. And he was just... No, Columbia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the other one. They so, need to write about Times Square. That's yeah, true. They own it all. So, um, anyway, yeah. uh, I reviewed the movie and said what I liked about it. Some things and didn't. But part of it is I just used it as a, uh, you know, a an catalyst excuse, for, an ex- yeah. a catalyst for yeah, yeah. sketching in sure. that thing i tried to make it you know relevant not gratuitous but i felt like yeah this is really relevant because it symbolizes something of course it's not just going on in new york it's going on everywhere right it's true but it, it, it's it does seem a little bit hyper steroidal in new york right i, I you know because uh, wall street is here it's a financial center of the co- of country one in the world and so it seems as though it's particularly like i say just on a, a scale that and and and, and yeah. speed that's not typical. Well, there's also the, the basic used, gentrification was an, an organic thing. I don't think what's going on in New York is organic. Yeah. It's it's all planned out by you know developers and politicians. I mean, you know, it's not. A, there is something essentially inorganic about it. And the idea that the way it used to work is that if you had a successful business, then it could sustain itself. And the fact that in example after example. What will suddenly go under is a very successful business mm-hmm. because the rent will just shoot up right. in a way that is not organic and in a way that never used to happen. Right. Yeah. And then land use policies change and all these things go on at the same time. But when you were first moved to New York, you could rent. You could spend like you had a, You didn't know how to pass an hour till your next appointment, or you just felt like going in on your lunch hour to a bookstore. Right. And you know that is still can you can still find a few, but. They all disappeared. You know, there was certainly a lot more before you and I were around to... They were, at one time, of course, thriving in, in all over Well, down. maybe, except that one of the stories of the last 30 years, hasn't it been that where, in a sense, it would seem there could be no better example of this sort of passing of an era than the passing of independent bookstores. Mm-hmm. People started to report on that early. Sure. And one of the things they came up with is, mm-hmm. hey, guess what? You'd think independent bookstores would be going the way of the dodo bird, but guess what? There has been a certain attrition, but even now, and I would apply this to today, I would say this is even true today, mm-hmm. there's still independent bookstores around, and I don't just mean in New York. Independent bookstores right. are something that, like radio, have survived technology and all of that. What I was going to remark on, I guess you're right, there are, but uh, it's not so easy to open a bookstore. Like It never was easy, I suppose, but right. it's, it's almost, almost probably impossible and me- well, many of the New York neighborhoods that yeah. where they once they once thrived, but what bothers me is you know there were a lot of the box stores came in big box stores like the Barnes and Nobles and the Borders and those types of stores, and then they too <laughs> were were not uh, you know the corporations that owned them didn't find that the stockholders were making enough money on them, and yeah. so they pulled out. Right, and so those stores disappeared. It's now the rents were so much higher. Who can afford those stores? The old bookstores that lost their leases can't do it. You know, it's well, too late. I, so know, to other... be honest with you, I, I live in dread of, of reading the headline one day uh, that you know, Barnes & Noble is going under, which for me would mean, I mean, there's obviously any number of them around New York, but, you know, the one I, I always go <laughs> to is Square. The Union Square. That's such a great bookstore. And yeah. the thing is, as, as long as a store like that is around, bookstore culture, whatever that is, in a sense, is thriving. You could go in there. You can get lost. It's mm-hmm. like a library. All of it. With Barnes & Noble goes away yeah i think that's it for that and that is, that is going to be such a loss mm. uh, well you know you could bring your kids there that was like i was lucky at least there were plenty still plenty when my son was of that age where there yeah. were like little kids you could take go to a bookstore on a rainy day <coughs> oh, totally. barnes noble and they had a big children's section they could just hang out there for a couple of hours and rest you know absolutely yeah that that going away and then by and large the, a lot of them there were bunch of them. every neighborhood had a Barnes and Noble for a while and that most of them are gone yeah right but uh, anyway I don't know how we got so 
carried away with this, but uh, it's it does occupy obviously a certain amount of my mind. I just want kind of harken back to a time where. And I just know that I'm just not setting a good example for the next generations. <laughs> I'm going to alienate all of them if they're listening because I'm just <laughs> turning it to that old guy. Right, exactly. You know, but I guess that's inevitable. Yeah. So anyway, but uh, I, hey, I don't feel that way about film. Well, I found, you know, to be honest with you, to go back, uh, to bring it back into film, yeah. but um, a way that I Please turned out do. to be an old guy, <laughs> maybe a little more than, uh, than I knew, and I'll fess up to this, is that the last time we did this podcast, mm-hmm. um, it was organized around my book. So I had this book Movie come freak. out. Movie yeah. yeah. And I never expected that book to be some huge seller or anything like that. But what I was interested in was uh, not the numbers, but the audience I would reach. Mm. I wanted to reach, you know, people who had experiences like I had. Yeah. But one of the reasons I decided to put a lot in there about um, Entertainment Weekly, for instance, and media, stuff like that, is mm. that I thought... You know, uh, the kinds of readers I had who grew up with me at Entertainment Weekly, they might want to read this book. And what I discovered was, no, the book the book's demographic mm-hmm. was really like people my age. Okay. And it was really interesting mm-hmm. to see. Was that frustrating? Um, there was an initial disappointment to that. I yeah. just was I like, you know, I because I wanted, you know, yeah. in other words, I knew I had a lot of fans who were much younger than me in Entertainment Weekly, and I just thought. Where are they? But they're not interested in reading a book about a film critic. That's okay. Yeah. But it was educational. Do you get a sense of uh, what they were buying, the physical <coughs> media, or if they were getting downloading like the digital version? You get all that information. Oh, that's... I don't think it's that, you know. I know that doesn't that doesn't have anything to do with the the age issue so much, but uh, I just wondered if you had that information, too. I don't so much, but I don't think it's that they don't read books or something like that. Yeah. I just think it's that maybe they grew up mm-hmm. in an era that was... A little less religious about film criticism. Yeah, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like the. I just remembering the book, and I was thinking about it a little bit since I knew we were going to be meeting. But I, I really enjoyed how you just incorporated those years at Entertainment Weekly with with your personal life and yeah. and, and or yeah, you know, and your just overall development as a human being. You know, it was all tied together, and yeah. I, I really that's something that you don't. I don't read too often when I'm reading it about you know well, it's usually they're talking about one or the other mm-hmm. but you kind of link them together very smoothly I thought. well the reason i decided to do that was simply that i realized early on i couldn't separate them i mm. couldn't separate yeah. them in my mind and part of it too was that i do think that there's a way that and i think this is especially true maybe even more true today than it used to be there's a mm-hmm. way that movie buffs cinephile <laughs> see this as a very high endeavor mm. We are into this high thing. We love art, mm. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, my whole take in Movie Freak was to say it is that, but I also saw it, and I'm using myself as an example rather than anyone else. I saw it as a pathology. Mm-hmm. I don't want it to talk about that. Okay. It, yeah. Almost like a <coughs> <laughs> somehow you contracted this this uh, disease. Yeah, and I think it's built into love the of writing of or movies. love of film. The love, or... of, uh, love of um, not the love of film. In other words, you can love an art form without it being a pathology. Right. But something about the nature of criticism movies. Okay. You know, um, the fact that it is mm-hmm. escaping into the dark and all mm-hmm. of that stuff. Right. I think that is built. I think that there is a way that a lot of cinephiles are people who are sort of trying to escape society yeah. because the grand irony of it is. You're escaping society, but movies are the most realistic art form. So you're doing it in order to watch the society that you're escaping on the big screen. Yeah, right. and I think a lot of movie buffs, whether they're you know shy or antisocial in this way, they have that. They they have some dimension of that. Mm. I but but without speaking for them, I certainly have it. So I wanted to talk about that. Right. It's interesting. I was just reading. This is not exactly what you're saying, but I just triggered this thought about since I'm reading, searching for John Ford. Yeah. By, by Joseph McBride, and he he said that John, or John Ford didn't like to move his camera too much. He wanted the audience, as they watched the film, to feel like it was it was real life. And the more you move the camera, you're just going to remind the audience that there's somebody shooting a movie. Oh, that's so, interesting. So I mean, obviously, that's a major thing with most filmmakers. You know, where to put the camera, how much to move it, yeah, and how much to incorporate your the making of a movie into your movie. You know that. Obviously, it's a conscious choice, and you know, he made his. And well, he says Renoir walked out of one early film and learned about not moving his camera. You know, it's kind of cool. Well, it's interesting to think that a director like John Ford, who we think of, 
when you think of his westerns, you think of him as crafting these kinds of mythological movies. But right. the idea that he so much thought in terms of realism, mm -hmm. plenty of the the great Hollywood, the great classic Hollywood directors certainly did, yeah. and that's certainly my aesthetic. I mean, my aesthetic is I'm always craving realism, and I'm always craving a better word for it. I mean, there's never a better word for it. It's such an abstract word. But for instance, I'll give you an example. Yeah, a movie of 2018 that expresses the Owen friendly realistic aesthetic to the nth degree is A Star is Born. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons it's my movie of the year. It is your um, movie of the year. I remember you telling me how much you enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm not going to say, you know, it feels like verite or something like that, but there was something about the way Bradley Cooper shot that movie and about the, the, the whole decision he made where the scenes really do play out with this very naturalistic rhythm. And in mm -hmm. a way, I think it really works, and obviously a lot of people think it works, but it's so counterintuitive to say, let's make a star is born in that style. Mm -hmm. But that's what works about it. Mm -hmm. That's what makes you believe in these characters independent of that melodramatic plot that they're all caught up in. Yet at the same time, the plot really works. So. Right, well, yeah, otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Something's working, right? This is the fourth version of it now? Or? Yeah. I never can keep fifth. counting, and it all depends on yeah. whether you count the uh, the first one that's not called The Star Is More. Oh, okay. Uh, what Price Hollywood? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that was the original one. I see. So I think it's maybe Who was the in fifth, that one? Do you remember? I can't remember no, now. It's not more. Top of my head. Yeah. But I think this is, you know, my favorite was always, I love the Judy Garland Judy version. Judy Garland. And, I would, and yeah. James Mason. Yeah. I just need a job. <laughs> it's just, if I could only, <coughs> it's all I need is a job. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You don't want to hear my Judy Garland. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to turn into the trip. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I enjoyed it. I loved it. Uh, the music was worked for me. And uh, I asked, actually, I spoke with Paul Williams oh, the wow. other day. Yeah. Because, uh, well, anyway, I did. And, you know, he wrote the music, good deal of music, or co wrote it for uh, the last one with or, Barbara right, Streisand. Right, Evergreen you know, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I asked, he hadn't seen it yet, but I was uh, so it was a lost opportunity. I'm like, well, go see it because yeah, I'm curious to know what your take on the new one. But uh, it was the music was co-written for the the Bradley Cooper version by Lady Gaga, right? And Luke Nelson, who is Willie Nelson's son. Oh, did you know that? I didn't know that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, anyway, just a little. Detail for yeah, you. No, I didn't, I didn't it's a, it was yeah. I thought it was really well made. I, like, where did this come from? How did Bradley Cooper know how to do that? Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe got some some just uh, help. I'm sure. To, yeah, but no, but I mean, I think there was a real vision holding that movie together. And I, clearly, I mean, it yeah. has to have come That's from the him. impressive part. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I wouldn't. So you do you do you kind of assume? I shouldn't say the word isn't assume, but it would be a pretty <coughs> good bet that that might make be the big big winner this year. At the Oscars? It's just so popularly uh, been I think so. I think, that, well. I think that, you know, 25 years ago it would have been a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. But um, the Oscars are changing or evolving in a strange way. And in a way, I will say this, you know, quite explicitly, in a way that I'm not really so for. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a part of me that wants to see the Oscars pick great movies and great performances and be elevated and really yeah. applaud art. Mm -hmm. And back in the old days, that we always used to make fun of them for going for this cheesy choice rather than mm -hmm. a more artful movie that might have even been a successful film. Mm -hmm. But now they're veering so far in that direction that my You're feeling is I don't want to see the Oscars become a duplicate of the Independent Spirit Awards. Mm -hmm. And the thing that bothers me about it, it's not that I have any problem with honoring independent films. I've been a champion of the American independent film movement since it started. Mm -hmm. But something bomb the whole thing we love about the Oscars is that they're the quintessence of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And we love this thing called Hollywood, even though they make too many comic book movies and mm -hmm. too many this movie and that. We love this thing called Hollywood. Something bothers me about the idea of the Oscars becoming a night where Hollywood takes pains not to honor what it does 364 days of the year. Mm -hmm. In other words, why are we even having a debate about whether certain movies should be nominated? I'll give you an example. Black Panther's a slam dunk. I mean, the moment I saw Black Panther, I was like, this is a phenomenon. It should be nominated for the Oscar. And fortunately, it looks like it's mm -hmm. going to be. It's going to get all the nominations. It will have its place there. But I'll give you an example 
of a movie I don't even like that much. I think Bohemian Rhapsody should be nominated for the Oscar. In other words, I haven't seen that one. I'm mixed mm-hmm. on the film. Some critics really loved it. I'm mixed. I've seen it twice. So this isn't talking about my taste. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that really struck me about that and that made Bohemian Rhapsody, like Black Panther, a phenomenon as well, people loved that movie. I mean, that movie struck a populist chord. I'm still, to be honest with you, not 100% sure why, but it did. People Mm -hmm. adored it. Mm -hmm. They just felt a connection with it. It It's a huge hit. Why not? Why why are the Oscars, given that we have a year where we have a movie like Bohemian Rhapsody that came out and was a sort of home run, even though it got certain mixed reviews, Mm -hmm. why can't, why shouldn't that be one of the Oscar nominees? Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems odd to me that you have that kind of phenomenon. But then when it comes to nominating the Oscars, the Oscars are like, oh, well, we're way too highbrow for that film. Well, Um, it's good that the Oscars maybe are getting less highbrow in that regard. And um, I do agree with the pomp and circumstances and appealing part of the history that is the Oscars. But that was a... That was a uh, superhero movie or comic book movie, whatever, that it transcends a bit, you know, and, and does elevate the, the genre a bit, right? right. It, it, it may, in some people's mind, not be successful or may not be their cup of tea. However, they can't or disagree with the fact that it does try to do more than the majority of the other ones that just destroy cities and where millions of people die. And, you know, you're not, I mean, that's where that seems to be constantly going on in, for the majority of the movie uh, so so maybe even though I don't think it will it could influence it could influence maybe superhero movies I doubt it I think superhero movies <coughs> like are going for international audience uh, they're going for Chinese audiences they're going for all these different things that I don't think even Black Panther was really but part interested of, part in part of what I'm saying is is that I think Black Panther will get its nominations and that's right. fine but what I'm saying is that there should have been many other superhero movies nominated in other words why was there even a debate about The Dark Knight why was there a debate about Wonder Woman I mean the Oscars used to nominate movies like The Turning Point why not just nominate popular films and also some really good ones I mean they can still continue to take you know cues from the critics uh, the critics groups and things like that at the year end mm-hmm. I just think that it's odd to me. It's an odd contradiction Here's... that Hollywood has never been the old world. We, the old world we used to use back in the old, you know, Hollywood is commercial. Hollywood is too commercial, or something. Hollywood has never been more commercial, than more it commercially is today. oriented at the expense right. of everything else than it is today. Or, so, so why should the Oscars reflect that less than they ever have? That seems a, odd to me. I think there's a. Here's where I could get in trouble, but I'm going to say this anyway. The pressure on the Oscars to lose that hashtag might play into Black Panther in particular, nominating a film that is uh, going to please the African-American community or those people that are just care a lot about a, a, more of an equity, a, a play, an well, even that, playing that, field. And that, that's, that's legitimate. That fa- that's totally legitimate, and that factor is there with Black Panther. That's why Black Panther is both a good example of this and not. There are... Ten good reasons to nominate Black Panther, but what right. I'm saying is, let's say we were having this conversation ten years ago, I could easily say, why is there any debate about the Oscars nominating The Dark Knight? Why would the Oscars mm. turn up their noses at a comic book movie when it's a better work of art than most of the movies they nominate? Mm, well, that's legitimate, and it may just be things are changing because of the pressure of, of, of you know, of the social pressures that that are coming out of the the Black Lives Matter and other movements. Right, but I'm not, like I said, is, I'm not talking about the racial is, issue. I'm just saying, in I know. general, I think the Oscars... But I think that, that but, well, here's where I'm trying to, where maybe I can answer that. I think if there were five other nominees with with primarily African-American storylines nominated, because there's maybe one or two, right, maybe? I mean, there's, if Beale Street could talk, what else is there? I'm listening, well, I'm listening. I think that... There's no, just not enough out there, so they're going to plumb the superhero movies, because that does exist. I don't know that the acting and all the other, the directorial level of quality that is their litmus is, you know, but it's not just the only thing I play. I understand there's a snobbiness that's existed about comedies, about superhero or action movies and things. They it just seems don't weird. get nominated. It seems weird for Hollywood to have... Critics can be snobs and I think critics sometimes these days are a little too snobby Mm -hmm. what I'm saying is it seems weird for Hollywood to be snobby 
about what it does. Makes about what it's making. This is yeah. all it does now. But Hollywood doesn't make independent films. Hollywood makes global crowd pleasers. It's so true. it seems to me that Black Panther aside and the issue of representation of mm-hmm. African Americans in films aside, as crucial as that issue is, yes. I'm saying the Oscars should nominate Bohemian Rhapsody. The Oscars should nominate Mary Poppins. Yeah, I hear great. Not ones. completely at the expense of films like The Favorite right. or Roma or uh-huh. whatever. But they should. The idea that we're fighting to have room at the table for popular films is yeah. a grand irony to me. Yeah. Well, I guess also. This is uh, the Oscars is the opportunity to, uh, you know, show that we we can put out qual you know like this high quality high art quality stuff and you know um, it's 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 a bit of BS but it's judging up the, it's judging up the table it's, right but what I'm what I'm suggesting yeah. is this that in a trivial way, the way that the world of movies, and I think critics are something to blame for this is becoming a little bit dichotomized in our minds Mm -hmm, between popcorn and art. I mean, the thing that I've always been searching for as a critic, as long as I've been doing this, and now almost a little more Mm -hmm. explicitly, is for movies that find the sweet spot. I mean, I like films that are art and not popular. I like films that are popular and not art. But I love Star is Born. I love... There's nothing like the sweet spot where it's both at once. Mm -hmm. It seems like a culture that has embraced the dichotomy and has mm-hmm. embraced the idea that popular films won't be art and art films won't be popular. That seems to me an analog of what's going on politically mm-hmm. with the two sides not speaking to each right, other. Yeah. And with, in a sense, the left risking being too elitist right. or whatever. Yeah, I mean, there is a, there is a kind of movie equivalent of a red state blue state divide sure what i'm saying is is that i don't want to see it in politics and i don't want to see it in In movies yeah peter biskin has been writing about that with his last book although it was more on television than movies but it's a bit of both about left movies and right movies and the audiences yeah well i i I agree with you i i kind of liked the last year's you know slate of uh well specifically best movies because they really even though shape of water wasn't my favorite but I did like that they were almost almost exceptional. Uh, without exception, they were all these movies that you're referring to. You may not <coughs> like them. I know you had problems with, uh, you know, and you can, I don't know how much you want to talk about, like uh, Roma and things like But I like seeing these these titles as uh, for best Oscar. Well, I Roma, feel like, I don't, even though I'm not the world's biggest fan of Roma, <laughs> I have no problem with that being this major yeah, player in, right. in the awards and all that. I have a bigger problem with, with Shape of Water. Like, mm-hmm. I really think that was one of the most unsatisfying Oscar winners. Yeah. Because in a weird way, it kind of fell between the cracks. As a work of art, I don't think it's successful because I basically thought it was a fantastic work of set design. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a pop, as a as a film that crosses over, it didn't really cross over that much. So it seemed to be satisfying both camps, but might maybe neither. How much is it? Well, because uh, okay, here's a, I'm curious to know what you think. There, be, if they let in, you know, by let in, I mean if they start nominating the corporate movies, okay, these yeah. comic book just, movies, just a few of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, any though. Yeah, you're opening the door for first of all uh, you know a barrage anyway but but then what is fox searchlight who spends a lot of time and probably money is i'm guessing for going after the your consideration for it right i mean they're they're wooing you and they're spending a lot of money and wooing you is my uh, right we were both Mm -hmm. at the party but uh they will no longer have nearly as big a shot for getting a well, movie. That's well, how they got a shape. I think that plays into how Shape of Water won the I, I Oscar. Don't know, I don't know about that. And, and it was just here's where I don't agree with that. First of all, I don't think the Oscars are so all powerful anyway when okay. it comes to the box office of a film and how these films get made. Well, here's a thing that I'm for that maybe a lot of people wouldn't be, but and it's not in any chance to um, cut off the possibilities for a company like Fox Searchlight, which mm-hmm. is a company I hugely love and believe in and think that they're, you know. It's because of them that we have movies like The Favorite, etc. Right. But I actually would like to see the Oscars, part of me would like to see the Oscars go back to nominating only five films. I, yeah. I feel like it made them all more more special. My point is, you know... It's diluted it. If you, just, if you nominate Mary Poppins and Black Panther and Bohemian Rhapsody, there'll still be room for The Favorite and Roma and A Star is Born, but you just won't be pretending right. that right. this is right. not a populist yeah. ceremony. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I think this year actually is going to... 
probably be something of a corrective along the lines of what I'm saying. I think it is going to veer a little more populist. I don't think it's out of the question that Bohemian Rhapsody could get a nomination. No. Certainly Rami Malek is going to get one. Right. I think you're right. I think it will. <coughs> I think the two of the ones, the two films that will s- probably sweep things up will be the two yeah. you were talking about. I just, you know, I'm obsessed with this issue because I do believe that, and, the star, and there's no better example, maybe even in recent years, than A Star is Born. Mm-hmm. A movie like that, that I mean, a lot of critics have put this on their 10 best list and stuff. A movie like that that's genuinely artful Mm -hmm. and at the same time strikes a genuine populist chord and is a huge hit where it kind of has it all. Mm -hmm. You know, you go great and nobody would object to that. But really, it is so rare now. Mm -hmm. It's like a frail blossom. Mm -hmm. And my take on movies is I want to see more movies like that. I don't want there to be just... One star is born a year. Yeah. Or at least I want to see movies trying for that more. In some ways, I think they're sort of, they sort of are. In other words, a thing I talked about a couple of years ago, I wrote this column that mm-hmm. um, right when they announced that Steven Spielberg's The Post had been greenlit, literally the weekend that announcement, so this would have been, um, it was at the beginning of 2017, mm-hmm. I wrote a column saying this is hugely significant because Steven Spielberg is making a movie about, yes, the Pentagon Papers, but really he's trying to comment on the Trump era and all of that. Mm -hmm. Very topical. It's Spielberg, so it has a chance to be great, as it turns out, now that we've seen The Post. The Post is a fine movie, but it's not great. Mm -hmm. But the point is, I said, I said, I feel something starting here. I feel the floodgates Mm. opening of making movies, popular movies, about real issues again. Mm Mm-hmm. A couple of months after that column ran, I thought back on it, and I thought, oh, well, that was kind of a lame column. I mean, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but yeah. come on, Spielberg's making this film. This isn't going to happen. Yeah. Now, here we are, close to two years after that announcement, one year after the post actually came out. I actually think the column was less goofy than I thought it was, because look at it. We're now surrounded by movies. We're getting more and more films, mm-hmm. like Vice, mm-hmm. that are topical, and... I'm not saying that it's becoming the 1970s again, but I think that Spielberg did light a little flame there. Mm-hmm. And I think there is a desire now to see movies about what's going on politically right. and, and stuff like that. Right. Well, I guess if Vice does well, it it will certainly reinforce that, right? <laughs> I think a lot will be riding on Vice. I yeah. personally think, um, I don't think it's going to be a blockbuster, but I think it'll do fine. Mm-hmm. I'm personally mixed on it. Yeah. I don't like Vice that much. Okay, I'm I'm, that one either. And I'm somewhat relieved to see that a number of critics have had mixed feelings about it the way I did. I was actually a little concerned that I was going to write the only mixed review of it and that it was going to get these yeah. raves. You're going to get hammered. Um, and then you're going to get hammered, right? Don't you get hammered when you're like the, I that guy? I don't necessarily get hammered, but when every critic loves something if you're writing a mixed review people can look at you and go well what was his problem that yeah, day right. Right. I didn't I didn't write that review to be different but a number of critics have kind of questioned I think some of the same things I have which is I don't know it seems to me a movie that kind of skates along the surface mm-hmm. even Christian Bale I think he does a phenomenal impersonation of Cheney right. really gets into the whole persona of the man yeah. that's terrific to see <clears throat> but I don't know if he quite has the opportunity to give a truly great performance because the thing I wanted from Vice, I wanted the film to give me an interpretation of what made Dick Cheney tick. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I don't think it really does that. Oh, no. It's more interested in the impersonation and the, the sort of the behind the, I don't even know. Well, it's interested in all these actions that he did. Yeah, and it's right. Inter- it's, it's a it, compilation it's of his greatest saying, hits. Look at how bad he was. Look yeah. at what he did. Except, where did this come from in him? And Is it like a little bit like a Batman villain? It's not, like, it's not that cartoonish, but okay. I don't think it's very psychologically sophisticated film. I see. And I think the problem with it is that even more so than in the big short, even though there's a couple of real comic sequences in Cheney, and I think they work wonderfully well. Mm-hmm. I think there should have almost been more of them. Mm-hmm. But when Adam McKay's doing that, he's mm-hmm. clearly in his element. element. Yeah. But... The comedy sequences, the Shakespearean dialogue, the mm-hmm. fake end credits that roll before Cheney becomes vice president. That stuff that, you know, has been cited by a lot of people, and that's all really funny and really good. That's like four minutes of the movie. Mm-hmm. You take that out, and Vice is essentially 
a straight biopic. There is a certain lightness to some of it, and the way that it's propulsive and jumps around in time. You know, it doesn't have quite the gravitas of something like Capote. Mm -hmm. But basically, Adam McKay really respects history in this film. He really serves it up pretty straight. Mm -hmm. He tells the story of Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. It isn't a satire. I don't understand people calling it a satire. Those five minutes of it are satirical. The movie is a biopic. And when you do that, you're actually... You know, you're raising your game. You're saying, "All right, now mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm playing with the big boys or the big girls." Yep. Yeah. But you know, this is a movie that's asking to be taken seriously. And on that level, I don't think it really comes up with an interpretation of who Dick Cheney was and why he did what he did that would take it to the next level. Mm-hmm. I'm not satisfied by just saying, "Oh, he was a bad guy. He was into greed and power." The movie actually shows you that he was this strange, opportunistic bureaucrat who mm-hmm. just kind of went along and you know became chief of staff and attached himself to other people. Mm-hmm. So when he becomes the Dark Lord and the leader in things like torture and the Iraq War, what is it? What's driving him? I think the fact that the film doesn't do that is a, is a crucial a flaw. flaw for me. Yeah. Right. It doesn't make it as uh, fulfilling an experience having seen it. Well, then what are you looking want at? It's, special it's, not, effects. it's not really delivering a lot of news right. in terms of what Dick Cheney did. And because this has all been reported on. Right. And it's also recent. Yeah. Too. Yeah. But there is a part of me that, in a way, I, I, there is, it's a compelling film in certain ways. I actually want to see it again. See it again. Just right. to see certain so, parts so, of it. Right. Not because I think I'm going to change my view of it. I just actually want to go right. back and experience it again. Yeah. Watch Bale's performance. I hope it does well because I think it's healthy to have films like Vice out sure. there. Yeah, with the, the Steve Carell is in a, also in a he's in that. I yeah. know he plays Rumsfeld, right? Yeah, and he's also in a, this adaptation of this documentary, uh, Marvel Call, out, Marvel Call yeah. that came out a few a while ago actually. But um, again, another example, I guess, of uh, where they're making films like this. That's a dark story, and you know, well, I, I may, I, maybe it's from the actors who are so powerful now, and they all want these pieces, like you know, the old days where they they're heroes and they're sympathetic, you know. And, and Carell was also in uh, uh, earlier in the year, right, with the uh, what yeah. was it called the uh, one with his uh, beautiful boy, beautiful boy, rather. Yeah. Thanks. Well, uh, I don't think that's so novel. In other words, no, but there's if we can if actors are going to be, you know. Instigating right. these films getting made, then that's then we'll see at least more things that could come out pretty good. I mean, see more. Well, I'm all for it. I mean, part of what happened is we had the 70s, which revolutionized films, which yeah. introduced the whole idea of intensely dark subject matter. Uh-huh. And then, even though that went underground a little bit, it was there in the 80s. It came back. You know, one of the things I talk about this in my book, but one of the interesting things when you think back on the 80s is that even though on some level I buy the myth 100% and it written about it many times mm-hmm. that the American independent film movement as we know it, I mean clearly it started with people like John Cassavetes, but I mean the modern American film movement really started 89, Sex Lies all of that. Mm-hmm. Well, it, What we're talking about when we talk about that is films but also a certain structure mm-hmm. namely Miramax or whatever but in other words, the ability of these films to get out there, to become popular films yeah, right. that was a revolution it started in 89, and it's been with us to this day. But an interesting thing is that when you think back on the 80s, and you go, well, where did the American independent, the modern American independent film movement start aesthetically? And even in terms of the films getting out there, it didn't really start with Sex Lies. In a sense, it started with the Coen brothers and David Lynch. Mm. I mean, we didn't call it that. We, there was just these you know, oddball films that came out. But the truth is that... Yeah, movies like Blood Simple well, and, Blue Vel- and Blue Velvet. Well, 80, you know, Blood 80s. Simple was 80... I never remember the year of Blood Simple. 86 or 7, I guess. It was 85. Oh, it was 85. Because um, I know... Uh, I, Blue, Velvet, right. Blue Velvet was 86. Mm-hmm. But in other words, that was up and going. And we're talking about, you know, intensely dark films. Mm-hmm. Once the American independent film movement was really up and running, 89, 90, the darkness never went away. In other yeah. words, we've yeah. always had those kinds of right. edgy films for the last 30 years. Yeah. And now, yeah, mainstream stars want to do them. One of the reasons that someone like Steve Carell, I think, is gravitating more to that kind of subject than you might expect is that the crossover to television has helped that because mm-hmm. so much interesting work is being done in television sure. and now there's right. so much credibility to doing material like that. Yeah. And I imagine... Yeah, I guess I, the choice to be taken seriously as a dramatic actor as opposed to just doing comedy 
is somewhat uh, his own is a product of his own uh, you know his own right. feelings about his career and how he wants to be perceived and probably because I'm sure Hollywood just love him to make one great comedy well but in some ways and, you know he's kind of struggling there in that he's doing the same things that yeah plenty of actors Jim have done Carrey, and Jim Carrey tried to do it and sometimes they make good films I was particularly uh, impressed with Carell right. in Foxcatcher yeah. I thought that performance was really daring and that it was a fantastic film even though it went nowhere right. but some of these things yeah, I mean, and the one with Welcome the... to Marwin is really a mixed bag of a film have you seen it? Yeah, oh, you yeah. Did see it. I saw it this week and okay. uh, wrote a little thing about it. And, and, you know, guess what? Surprise, surprise, the documentary was better. I could have told Robert Zemeckis that the, say, the, the day he started writing money. the script. <laughs> Don't make this film. It's yeah. not going to work yeah. commercially or any other way. I do get why he wanted to make it. In other words, he wanted to um, immerse you in this world of dolls. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, what I could have told him, because I've seen enough Zemeckis film, and I really respect his talent. I think Robert Zemeckis great. His best is a great, great director. But he has this side that's too gimmicky, that's drawn to technology. I mean, even if you love Zemeckis, mm -hmm. who loved the Polar Express? Yeah, I was going to mention that. Who loved yeah. Death Becomes Her? He gets drawn, and, and my, my argument would be, even though a lot of people love Forrest Gump, I think in a certain way that's an example of that syndrome, where yeah. he's just too into the technology. But this is definitely an example of that, where yeah. he's like... I'm going to immerse you in this world mm -hmm. of Marwin, this 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 G.I. Joe Barbie doll world that this guy lives in. It's going to become your experience. And what I could have just told him from day one is, it's actually going to be almost impossible for you to make that an, an, our experience. And sure enough, we're watching this digitized G.I. Oh, Joe no. version of Steve Carell, and you feel kind of outside those scenes. It's like, what's really happening in them? It's not really that interesting. Visually, it's kind of arresting. Right. And but I really that, that, appreciated what Zemeckis was trying to do. I think he right. had a serious response to the film, and he doesn't in any way compromise the quirks of this character. But the movie doesn't work. Yeah. But you can respect him for risk-taking, I guess, is yeah, pos sure. possibly. Sure. But next time, if you're listening, Robert, talk to Owen before... The next time you try something along exactly. this, he might might give you some good advice. And another one I enjoyed, well, and I'm not sure it, it probably will be overlooked as my guest. Speaking of comedians taking serious roles, and Fox Searchlight is "Can You Ever Forgive Me?" Which um, you know, I thought I'm not as I'm not as wild about that film as a lot of people. And let me tell you why: I have not written about it. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised when it came out and it started getting raves. Did it? Okay. Because I mm -hmm. saw it and I thought. It was fine. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought Melissa McCarthy was good in it. But by the end, I was like, for me, there's something missing from this movie. And here's what it was. The movie is about a certain level of obsession. And at the end of the film, the character says that even though, you know, she's been caught and she's going to be fine and go to jail or whatever, because she was a writer writing these fake letters... Mm -hmm gave her a high you know it was kind of like wow doing this was you know mm -hmm. great even though it was criminal and all that and, you, and there's a wonderful irony about that she, what she's doing is scurrilous indefensible and yet at the same time you might say there's something kind of great in it because it is creative mm -hmm. I don't think that's really there in the movie though you do understand that she's a talented writer and that she's only able to write these letters because mm -hmm. she has writing talent and can mimic other people's voices. But I think what... I don't think it's really Melissa McCarthy's fault. I think what the movie doesn't show you quite enough of... Um, no th I'll have a splash. No thanks. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Actually, I'll get one more cappuccino. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to feel more that this was... A mission she got caught up in and what I felt in the movie was that every time she did one of these things it was for the reason that she needed money yeah and that's fine right but I see it is an other, opportunity in well a the sense. idea the idea that I'm forgetting the character's name but the idea that the Melissa McCarthy character something Israel right uh, 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 yeah um, Lee Israel Lee Israel that Lee Israel mm -hmm. what I wish the movie had pushed more was that Lee Israel when she was doing this absolutely indefensible stuff was really becoming an artist mm -hmm. in a certain way yeah right it's almost like the Ed Wood idea of these yeah, right yeah and then it makes artists. you and then it makes you kind of struggle with this 
moral dilemma. Right. What about that? What if, what if you're doing something wrong, but it does have a legitimate artistic element to it? Right. That's kind of exciting and 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 legitimate. Yeah, Most people I've talked to who really like the film say that that element is there. But I don't feel I didn't you don't feel, feel it, like it. I didn't feel it dramatically. On the other hand, I love much about the film. I think that director is very, very gifted, and I loved its creation of New York at a time that now seems yeah long going, ago. The 90s. We're going full circle here. Yeah, right. It actually film shot in probably every existing bookstore. That's right. <laughs> you know, some of the stars of the movie are the existing, still remaining bookstores. That's right. In New York and, those, City. and that great bar that they go to. I oh, love right. those scenes. And, yeah. And Richard Grant is great. Richard I mean, Grant. I've been back in form. I looked up his credits the other day, and I guess I was almost surprised to see that the movie that got me onto him with Nail was his very first film. I know. I yeah. didn't yeah. remember that. I assumed he would have had a few smaller credits beforehand, but that's right. the very first credit. Um, in 1987, my favorite movie of the year, because it's one of my favorite movies of all time was Full Metal Jacket yeah. my number two favorite movie of the year was with Nail that's how much of a fanatic I was for that film yeah, I just loved a, it and I loved him there's a whole yeah, yeah there's a lot of uh, is a whole sort of generation of people who, who feel that way about, yeah. about with Nail and I yeah you know it, and it was like part of we were very lucky I think just uh, again during that period that you were talking about before in, in the mid to late 80s into the mid to late 90s where because all of a sudden these uh, independent, truly independent distribut- distributors, it wasn't just American films. It was actually, we were getting also yeah. real distribution for these international films. Yeah. And they played in the movie theater sometimes for weeks, <coughs> if not longer. Right. Oh, there was uh, a tremendous were, energy like coming he, from... That's how I discovered all my, so many of my favorite filmmakers, like you know Ken Loach and Mike Lee. And, and, and the, you know, there were just a lot of great films coming in. Uh, that actually played in theaters, you know. Yeah. There was a lot of energy coming from yeah. England at the time. And right. Stephen Frears and Stephen stuff. Stephen Frears yeah. is another great I mean, in the, in, to the extent that those movies just... Um, uh, I remember going to them and, you know, they, they energized the art house. Right. You yeah. just, you felt it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I agree. Yeah, Stephen Frears is... In the, uh, and then they... Well, Stephen ended up, I guess, going kind of towards the Hollywood... Yeah, which I didn't think was the greatest choice for me personally. I don't know. <laughs> I, I always felt choice. like he had a kind of mainstream talent. I think yeah. he made the right choice to want to make mm-hmm. bigger mainstream movies. It just he turned out to be not that great at it. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, and Mike. I guess Mike Lee stayed a little closer to his roots. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Um, did you did you, were you did you get a chance to see? They were going to distribute his new film, uh, which is. Oh, Peter Liu. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. Because they were originally going to distribute it right around now, mm-hmm. uh, or November, December, some, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. And then it got pushed. It was already distributed, I think, in the UK, but right. it hasn't been distributed in the United States. So they showed. So they had a bunch of screenings some time ago, late summer, I guess, in, in anticipating that it right. was going to be released in the late fall or something. So I got to see it, and I was going to have him on the podcast, actually. And then they pushed it back to next spring or something. Yeah, or something like it, that. it premiered at Venice, and I didn't get to see it. I was curious about it, but it didn't get a good response no. overall. No. I liked it, but, you know, it's not definitely, if you're going to make a best of, Mike, you know, make your top ten, it's not going to be on that, probably. Yeah. Or it'll be at the very, very bottom. But um, still in all, if that's the one that brings me Mike Lee on the podcast, I'm only too happy to talk about it. Uh, I've interviewed him before, and I keep a couple of times actually for you know other things I wrote for other websites with him. Uh, thank you oh thanks but it'll be a thrill but I always get him pissed off because I'll bring something up that you know and then it's like it's something I some self-destructive streak I guess he's so he sort of doesn't you know he's kind of like um, suffers no fools type of guy yeah, you know sure. but I mean he's but he's also probably you know only he's like likes to talk about I'm sure things that give him pleasure like making films after rehearsing for a long period those types of s- s- subjects but when I brought up how I, I you know in anticipation of meeting you I, I watched all of your teleplays from you know from the 70s and 80s and, and then he got pissed off because the versions that we got here were so bad in the mm. UK they, you know they've restored them and they look fantastic but we got crap here and yeah, he went right. off on a rant and I said okay <laughs> and then the next time I met with him I reminded him of what, how I pissed him off about it it's just, <laughs> why would you do that just I just thought it was funny. Yeah, well, I can understand why you would feel that way. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Sure, sure. Why not? Any other any other films that uh, that uh, have been on your radar or that where you think might be up for uh, nomination? 
that I missed or we'd missed? Well, I'm trying to think. Um, we probably covered most of the the big ones. Yeah. Um, well, we haven't really talked about Roma. No, we didn't. Um, the, yeah. As soon as I saw Roma, and we came I knew out of that to, at the same. T- we saw the same. We were at the same screening. That's right. I saw it. It was before the Venice Film Festival, and as soon as I walked out of it, I knew I was going to be on a very lonely island with that film. <laughs> Um, I yeah. knew it, the way that it was going to be acclaimed, and um, mm-hmm. I just didn't. I've been back to see it a second time, oh, and have? my feelings Did they about it, it have not no? changed. Okay, um, I just feel I think it's a good film, but I There's I a, feel a certain remove in watching it. Uh-huh. Um, a friend of mine who loves the film actually I thought really captured what's a little odd about it, which is that he said it's a film shot entirely in, in medium shot or almost long shot. Right. In other words, yeah. it's not, I mean, it's all done by design. It's not, you know, pretending to create family scenes built around mm-hmm. intricate dialogue. Yes. You know, you're kind of hanging back, but I didn't get that hanging back quality. I got it at certain moments, mm-hmm. but then at a certain point I was like, no, let's move forward. Let's move into these people's lives more. Um, I was frustrated, for instance, in you know the portrait of the breakdown of that marriage. It's just as soon as that happened, I know this sounds like a horribly lowbrow way to say it, but it, it just started to leave me with so many questions, partly because it is very convincingly staged, and I had built up a fair amount of curiosity about these people. Well, and, if it, uh, yeah, but it was... And it was it... You've seen it twice. Was it from the perspective of the child... You know, was it there was the young son, right? Was it from his POV? Because There's in that case, he would be limited to what he knows about his parents' I relationship. It, I don't think it, it it sticks to any clean set of rules in terms of point of view. The one it sticks it, to no, most okay, is probably the housekeeper, right? But sure, right. Mostly, it just seems like this God's eye point of view. I mean, I think it is mostly the housekeeper thing. But on the other hand, a problem I have with the movie is that. I don't know. There's been this whole wave of kind of woke criticism of Roma. Yeah. And in general these days, I don't tend to find myself on the same side as the woke criticism of things. But in this case, I kind of am. Yeah. Because my feeling is that the housekeeper character is so much of a saint. And it's even there. This struck me even more the second time I saw it. The first time you see it, the whole scene with her and the baby in the hospital, I mean, that's just so powerful and devastating. So you have that experience of watching that. Spoiler, brother. And then, mm-hmm. well, I didn't say what happened. No. And then later on, she alludes to it. Mm-hmm. And she kind of says, well, I didn't really want that baby. But it seems to me almost a kind of design. It's almost as if <laughs> God meant her to just be with this family. Uh, oh, right. Which, is, which could be interpreted as racist. Yes, as a strong, a well, strong I'm glad you said that word and I didn't. Well, I, I said it for a reason, you know, because <laughs> yeah. I knew that that's probably how you felt. But um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, because it's it's patronizing on a level, and it's kind of uh, right. it goes against its own best interest in the sense that you're trying to present an empowered character that, despite her poverty, despite her position, that she can walk into an ocean and pluck these kids out of the, you know, from being sucked into the right. the void and, <coughs> you know, and save their lives. And she's a hero, right? And yet, but she's not worthy of having her own children. She has to take care of those children. Right. And it's just something it's a that's mixed a message little anyway. disquieting yeah. about that. Certainly, that performance is terrific, and certainly you get right. closer to her than you do to any other character in the film. Yeah. There are moments when you feel very close to her. Yeah. And to the extent that you don't, to the extent that you are at a remove, the central odd thing about Roma to me is it's clearly all by design. Mm-hmm. I mean, I do think that Caron made shot for shot the film he wanted to make. But I think what that remove is about is on some level the film holding up each shot before you mm-hmm. as a kind of art object. Mm-hmm. And I do think that it's kind of impressed people in that way. I call it a coffee table book of a movie and mm-hmm. I stand by that. Mm-hmm. It's one gorgeous, dazzling still after another. Look, so is Cold and War. It could very well and Cold War is a movie. Oh no, that's me. the one we walked out of together. Not, right, I, right. I don't. We did not see. Uh, we did not see Roma. Well, we Cold, Cold War is War. Inter- interesting. And case I just for had me. on Pavel Pavlovsky, so 
Yeah. Take Cold, it easy. Take Cold it easy. War. Well, Cold know. War is a film I don't think works in a sense that it draws you into this very compelling story. Mm-hmm. It's beautifully shot. The images truly are expressive. Sure. All of it. But in the Again, end, coffee table. the yeah. way that story ends, the way it resolves itself, completely unconvincing to me. It did not work. And I think some of the sentiment for the film is that you know, people just love to get bowled over by these images that look like art. And yet that's not really what the art of movie making is, I don't think. And then the politics behind the, the, the political themes yeah. become pastiche in a way, and they lose, they get diluted a bit. I uh, think because, they do get diluted. Yeah, yeah, because of that. Yeah. yeah. Interestingly, both both Roma and uh, Cold War are biographical, by the, both directors' <coughs> yeah. childhoods. Uh, well, not childhood in... in uh, Poplikowski's, he, that was before he was born, but those are his parents, yeah. according to you know, his, his, yeah. his own. It wasn't a, wasn't a convincing film for me. But, mm-hmm. um, but you know, so, but I kind of had that feeling about Roma. Yeah, sure Roma, enough, though, could happening. upset your the whole scheme. You know, it could be that, that, that film that ends up winning because cause it just does. I think it's knows? possible that Roma yeah. could win. Yeah. I also think it's possible that the favorite could win. Right now, that is a great film. I mean, I that's were... a beautiful film. <coughs> well, I think it's really terrific. If yeah. I'm betting right now, yeah. I'd still bet on the Star, Star is Born. Is born. But you know, the other thing to talk about, Roma, is um, a movie that's also very significant in terms of this whole Netflix situation. <laughs> and I do feel that a lot about that really bothers me. I do think that Netflix has succeeded almost in creating certain mythologies about themselves. The key one being, because I hear everybody parroting this, even people who don't like Netflix will... Parroting or uh, parodying? Uh, pa- parroting. Parroting. The people who don't like ne- like Netflix will tell this to you, will repeat it as if it's an article of faith, that whatever you think of Netflix, of course they're making a bunch of films that no one else would make. And I think this is a pure mythology in the sense that the official budget of Roma is $15 million. I've been told that it may well have cost much more than that, but mm-hmm. that's the official budget. Mm-hmm. It's not a break the, break the bank budget. It's mm-hmm. maybe high for a certain kind of film. But Caron was coming off Gravity, an incredible movie. I think he's right. at his yeah. best. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, clearly hugely successful. He could have done anything he wanted. You're telling me that if it wasn't for a company called Netflix, Alfonso Cuaron, after Gravity, couldn't have made this loving autobiographical film for $15 million. No one would have backed it. But more to the point, let's say in my alternative universe that I'm actually right, that yes, some company on this earth would have backed Roma that wasn't Netflix. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting, and this is something I want to do a column on. I may actually be doing it this weekend. Let's pretend that it happened. Let's just pretend for the sake of argument that it was Fox Searchlight, just because they're such a convenient... Um, company to talk about in terms of the way that we know they get behind their titles and are very successful at selling independent films in the way that Harvey Weinstein sort of taught everybody to do. Let's pretend that Roma was a Fox Searchlight film. Stranger things have happened. Mm -hmm. What kind of, what would we be talking about? How would that film get out there? Because it really irritates me, to be honest with you. You can't do, I can't do a podcast if I don't have one moment when I say something that really irritates me. It irritates me to be at a party or something like that and be talking to somebody about Roma and the other person loves the film. They're a great believer in it. Like, this this is actually a, happened, this ladies is and gentlemen. Like a, a masterpiece. <laughs> we were standing in the party and doing this. And I will be like, well, I'm not so crazy about it. Yeah. And I'll say to them, but you know, I think if it didn't have this Netflix factor, it would be a really successful film. And they'd say, well, this is somebody who loves the film. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's black and white and it's about these poor Mexicans. And you want to go, wait a minute, what world are you living in? Are we living in a world where there has not been a successful really super successful art film in the last 60 years I can name one or two my point is that Ida <laughs> but but Ida was Ida in other words Ida played yeah. a you know, right. small theater let's say that Roma was a Fox Searchlight film mm-hmm. with the acclaim it's gotten with the wanna see factor and, the, and with the fact that despite my misgivings about it Roma is a thousand percent something to see. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a serious movie, and it's a good movie. Right. I really and do it, like it. I just it, don't think it's, right, you know, no. the be-all and end-all. How much money would that movie make? I think it's a 40 or $50 million movie. I say that to people. They look at me like I'm nuts mm. because mm-hmm. they want to preserve. Even, it's like, even people from the left, mm-hmm. they want to preserve the dichotomy now. Everyone's invested in the dichotomy. 
popcorn versus art. I see. The popcorn people, in other words, the masses of Americans that go to see comic book movies and don't give a fuck about any other movies, they're invested in those movies self-righteously. They're mm -hmm. like, give me my Avengers movie and fuck you and your art. Mm -hmm. The left has almost the opposite view. Mm -hmm. They're invested in their snobbery. They're like, oh, well, you know, yeah, I can watch an Avengers movie, but... I really love a movie like Roma or First Reformed, and of course that's not going to be a big hit. In other words, of course I'm part of the smart brigade that I like that film. Mm -hmm. But I think in the case of Roma, we'll never know because it's being given an incredibly marginal release by Netflix, but in the case of Roma, I think they're really wrong. I think Roma would have been a hugely successful film. In part based on... The coming off of gravity, uh, right? Essentially, oh, the fact more than that, that Corone is and he's a star, a kind, not just a star, he is a kind of wizard of okay. a filmmaker. I mean, I think he's a wizard in Roma. I mean, crafting yeah, yeah, those yeah, images yeah. Right, right. is amazing, and there is something the film does that's amazing, even though I feel emotionally remote from it, and that's the reason it's not a 10 best mm -hmm. movie for me. I think it's a movie that anyone interested in the art of film would want to see and I think it easily could have been a much more successful film than people are thinking Netflix is almost banking on the idea yeah. that people see it as a marginal film so that the way that they've marginalized it further that they won't be criminalized for that I see. but actually what they've done is they've just basically buried it they they oh they haven't paid they haven't spent a lot of money uh, well it's going to it's, gonna be, it's, gonna, it's getting it's like their banner get, a very, very token yeah. release. And here's a frustrating thing to me. This is another thing that, that sort of bothers me about Netflix. Mm -hmm. Netflix says, well, look, at our model is the new model, the 21st century model, which is, you forget about theaters. Roma became available on Netflix on December 14th. We want people all over the world who are subscribers to Netflix to see it. Go, okay, great. If that's your model, that's legitimate. Mm -hmm. Share the numbers with us. Yeah. The fact that they won't do that. Yeah. Why can't we know how many people watched Roma? Maybe it's really impressive. Mm -hmm. But if that's your new model, why mm -hmm. wouldn't you say... And I'm not saying that a lot of people didn't see that, didn't see the film. Maybe they did. But wouldn't you want to say, guess what? In its opening weekend, X number of people saw Roma on Netflix. It would seem to me that the company would have an interest in saying that. Mm -hmm. Because let's say that it was a really impressive number. That's the ultimate proof that they really are representing yeah. a new model of how people are going to watch movies. But the fact that they won't say it, mm -hmm. I don't think it's that they're hiding that the number was terrible. No. I think it's that what they're saying is we have a value. We have something we value even more than advertising how popular Roma was on Netflix. That thing we value even more than that is our secrecy. In other words, their corporate code. And that... It could also be Netflix is more important than the movie in, you know, in their branding. Right. And right. it could also be that... Once you give transparency, you can't control the, the, the narrative. You can't just do it for that one film. Yeah, yeah. But I do think there is a feeling that when you think about Roma and you think about it being on Netflix, there is a way that Netflix almost seems more important than Roma. And it seems like, no, they should be putting it out there in such a way sure. that yeah. allows the film to assume its full importance. I do think it's probably not going to help it at the Oscars. Mm. I think in, right. in my that's alternative right. universe, right. Right. Roma would be more of a contender for best yeah. picture than that's it's right. going to be. Yeah. I still wouldn't rule it out. Right. I mean, in, in, you know, in an Oscar landscape where Moonlight could win over La La Land, maybe Roma can win over A Star Is Born. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Yeah. I mean, if anything, right. Roma is a more acclaimed film than even Moonlight was. Right. Right. It's just in, it's, it could be one of those situations where. It's the splitting the audience type of situation that seems to keep happening. Yeah. Although, it, I don't know what's going on. When you have ten films in the plan, I don't know that that works quite the same way. But um, an interesting black. Uh, you, you brought up Cold War before, and Pavel's on this week's episode. But that's on Amazon, so similar type right. of thing. But that's but, a totally different game. Yeah. And Amazon is committed to theaters. Right. They put out the theatrically before they put it on. Right. right. Yeah. And Netflix, they don't. They do like a limited theatrical. They'll allow it, but they don't do it. I mean, they don't have nothing to do with it, right? <coughs> they'll allow it for certain films to have limited theatrical. So for con 
Oscar contention, right? Well, they have to open anything in, in theaters New York for, for Oscar contention. But right, right. the amount you have to open it is incredibly limited. Right. And yeah. most of my experience, I mean, this is only a few years old. I, and I happen, by sheer coincidence, I happen to live pretty close to the theater in New York where the Netflix movies play. Oh, like Mudbound, for Center. instance, the IFC Center. Yeah, yeah. The IFC Center becomes, on occasion, the Netflix theater. Right. And what I've seen is, you know, if you walk by that theater and Mudbound is on the marquee or something, you can go, oh, look at that, it's on the theater. Yeah. But, yeah. but obviously it's just, uh, IFC Theater is a great, the IFC Center is a great, great place, but it's just one art theater, right. kind of art multiplex. Um what I've become intensely aware of is that in terms of theatrical, these Netflix films seem to go into a Bermuda Triangle. There's not a sense <laughs> yeah. of them being out there. Right. Remember what, what would happen when we were younger with a film that, even an art film that would just, you know, hit, hit it with audiences and right. connect, is that it would come out, it would go to theaters, it might be at one theater, but then the lines would go around the block, and it right. would be there a couple, then another theater would put it in, it would go into another theater, then it would maybe be out for weeks and weeks, and then it would go away, but then it would come back, you know, it would come out in theaters again, and that still does happen in a lim- very limited number <coughs> of films for the Oscar contention, what have you, but yeah, it's like, uh, but look, the model that, that, we've had. that can't happen once Netflix, it's in the Netflix right. The model we've platform. had since the 90s, yeah. the model that sort of started with Sex Lies uh-huh. was that artistic films could get out there, could be popular, could make a lot of money. And it's not just about money, because money represents how many people are seeing these films. Mm-hmm. And Netflix would make the argument that a tremendous number of people are seeing their films, they're just seeing them through a different medium. But it's not just about money. It's about awareness. Part of what you know, we talk about, we say things like, movies used to own the conversation and we say well maybe television kind of owns the conversation these days Mm -hmm. Um, maybe television started you know in the era of peak television maybe TV started to steal the conversation from movies Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was Tina Brown who patented that phrase the conversation (laughs) you know but it's a great it's a great phrase because Uh it's, it's, it's very useful it is about that place where buzz kind of means something this year I think in terms of the conversation Movies won a little of it back from television. I mm-hmm. think movies had a stronger year than television. So mm-hmm. we got a little of the conversation back. But the bottom line is this. The conversation about culture, especially popular culture, matters. It's part of the way, like mm-hmm. part of the experience this year of A Star is Born wasn't just that it made a lot of money for somebody or even that a lot of people saw it, but that a lot of people were talking about it. Mm-hmm. That's part... It's endemic to movies. It's not just I went in a darkened theater and saw A Star is Born on a big screen and had that larger-than-life carry-me-away experience. It's also that. And then I went and talked about it, and that's all part of what movies are. Netflix is removing us from all of that with this release pattern. And um, I think there is, you know, in a way, less talk about their films. Um, But Rome is a paradox because... It's so acclaimed that there's talk about it anyway. Mm-hmm. Owen Gleiberman is the chief film critic for Variety. Welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming back on. Oh, thanks for having me. So true. I, I just enjoy. I love. I really like you a lot, of course, and I also just learn so much and I expands my thinking, which is crucial. So I appreciate. I appreciate your coming on and and, and spending some time. Uh, uh, let's do this again next year. I would love to. 